each other or you don't know each other actually i'm sure you're going to have many many opportunities opportunities during the next few days to get to know each other now let me start by thanking you all for coming i know that some of you are coming from very far as far as australia so it cannot be farther than that i think <laughs> Uh, and for those of you that are actually coming from closer, I, I also understand that it's very difficult to take off from your daily life actually for a week. It's very challenging, especially if you have dependents and things like this. So I really appreciate that you are here, that you chose this meeting, and I hope that you're gonna enjoy what we have prepared for you. So is, what is that that we have prepared for you actually? So we th we've prepared what we think is a great program. Obviously I'm biased, we have spent a lot of time doing this. Uh, but we have outstanding speakers, we have the meet the speaker sessions, we have uh, fun activities so that you get to know each other and you can have discussions and we have also um, specific activities to spark collaborations between you. So I think, I hope actually that you're gonna like it. Now, when I say we all the time, I mean the organizing committee of the meeting and I want to introduce you everyone in the organizing committee because I think it's important that if you have any questions during the meeting, any problems that arise, we are here to help you but you need to know them in order to ask the questions. So here's the organizing team. Let me start by the external members of the organizing committee. This is Tomale Kui, Tomale Kui up here, and, and Moni Monica bettencourt Uh They have helped us a lot. I don't know if they're here. Have anyone seen them? They're gonna come, so you actually, so if you wanna talk to them, they're gonna be here. Uh, they have helped us a lot in the scientific organization of the meeting. And then all the other organizing members are from the Physics of Life excellent cluster here in TU Dresden. And that's me, actually. I'm the managing director of the cluster. Rita and Benjamin both are here, and they are group leaders at the Excellence Cluster. Stefan Grill, I don't know where he is uh, here. Actually, he used to be also the managing director before me of the cluster, and now he's a Max Planck director. Um, and then we have a lot of support from the administrative team, Angela Jacobi, Ilona Kreher, and um, Kirsten Pels are up there. You can say hi, actually, so everyone knows you. So I wanna thank you all for the organization, uh, Angela, Ilona, Kirsten, in particular Rita and, and Ben. They have worked tirelessly to make this event that we're doing here today. So please, let's give them a hand, actually, even before starting. And uh, I also want to thank actually all the um, volunteers. We have a lot of volunteers that are helping us with the organization, so thank you as well. Now, if you have any questions, as I said, please ask us. Now, before we start with the scientific part of the meeting, uh, today we have, this, we have the pleasure actually to have the rector of our university, Professor uh, Staudinger here with us, and I asked her actually to give some uh, welcome remarks actually for the meeting, and she has kindly agreed. So please welcome Professor Staudinger. Thank you, O'Shea. Thanks for having me. And most of all, welcome you all, the attendees of the second EMBO workshop, Physics of Living System, here at TUD, Dresden University of Technology, and the Dresden Concept Inno Science and Innovation Campus. It's amazing to see the room full and getting fuller, I'm sure, over the next couple of days because the first workshop of this kind had to be held digitally and I know Stefan Grill was very sad about that. Nevertheless, you did it and it was also well attended and I think it speaks to the science uh, that you bring together under the umbrella here. So, 350 scientists have signed up to be here and from all over the world for five days. And let me tell you that cooperation across disciplines, across institutions, across nations and countries has become essential when we wanna push the boundaries of knowledge. And EMBO conferences are an ideal way of getting countries, disciplines under the umbrella of a complex interdisciplinary theme together. And you all know this and you cherish this. So in the coming days, 
physicists, biologists, biochemists, and engineers will push forward our knowledge about the physics of living systems. And this, you all know, is a field of research which we, will, we hope will help us to unravel some of the endless complexities of living systems by testing whether or to which degree the laws of physics may actually apply to living matter also and or whether living matter actually even harbors new physical laws yet unknown. So without doubt, understanding life down to its smallest components is one of the greatest but also most complex scientific challenges of our times. And I would deeply like to thank the EMBO committee, which for a second time has selected TOD and Dresden as the place to conduct this very special workshop. I think this decision, as well as the outstanding scientists having come here from afar and participating again in this workshop, give testimony to the fact that TUD and Dresden Concept Science and Innovation Campus is at the forefront of this new field, physics of living systems. In that vein, we very much hope to establish this international conference as a recurring event here in Dresden. Since the early 2000s, Dresden Concept Science and Innovation Campus has developed into a global center of interdisciplinary research, and especially in the field of life sciences. Many new centers and institutes have been established since then on our campus, Biotech, CRTD, B-Cube, and we were able to attract large amounts of funding, federal funding from Berlin, as well as funding from massive investments from the state of Saxony to conduct basic life science research, which then also laid the foundation for our successful acquisition of the Cluster of Excellence Physics of Life in 2019. Paul Physics of Life represents a unique collaboration that actually is testimony to the strength of our Dresden Concept Science and Innovation Campus because under the umbrella of, of Paul, Max Planck Institute of Cellular Biology and Genetics, the Max Planck Institute for the Physics of Complex Systems, our Faculty of Biology, the Center for Molecular and Cellular Bioengineering, CMBC, collaborate to bring forward this amazing and very novel and innovative undertaking to unravel more of the complexities of living matter. And it is also placed, Paul, that is at the center of our Johannstadt campus, which is just adjacent to our medical campus and to our medical, to our university hospital, which of course, further down the line is crucial in order to have uh, that closeness and being able to move towards translational attempts. So I think Paul exemplifies in an ideal manner the power of the Dresden concept and sci or science and innovation campus. And what is it? This is the alliance of 36 non-university research institutions together with us, TU Dresden, which have joined forces to create new synergies and jointly develop Dresden as the research location in multiple fields, one of which being the life sciences. And I would like to thank also all of the people who made this meeting happen and maybe being able to bring it back to Dresden. First and foremost, of course, O'Shea Campus, the head of our excellence cluster, Paul, uh, Monica betoncourt diaz Benjamin Friedrich, um, Stefan Grill, Thomas, Le uh, Thomas Lequy, Rita Matthäus, and also the admin team of Paul, which was pointed out before. And of course, the CRTD, who gives us their premises to carry out the workshop. There are sponsors to be thanked, and last but not least, EMBO, 
which uh, gave us the opportunity to hold it again and to also financially support it. So I hope you have five very exciting days ahead of you, filled with great encounters, because this is what these conferences and workshops are for, great encounters that give rise to new ideas, and newly, you know, the, the interactions between minds bring about new ideas, new insights, new perspectives. And as you are working hard for the next five days, I'm sure you will, don't forget to party, don't forget to enjoy yourselves, and I'm happy to tell you that Dresden is actually providing plenty of opportunities to do so. I hope the weather will be with us as well. We have adjacent vineyards and we have a great river where you can take boat cruises. So work hard, party hard, and enjoy Dresden, enjoy our science and innovation campus here at Dresden. Thank you for having me and welcome to TUD. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so now we're gonna get started actually with our scientific part of the meeting. And I cannot think of uh, a better way to do that than to start with an outstanding scientist for our first keynote lecture of the meeting. That's Rob Phillips. Um, I told you I was gonna embarrass you a little bit, so here it is. <laughs> so so uh, for us actually working in the field of biological physics and quantitative biology, Rob needs I would say no introduction actually. He's, in my opinion, probably one of the most influential scientists in our field, not only for his uh, achievements, actually scientific achievements that he's done over the years, the things that he's worked on, even things actually that are not in biological physics, but because he brought the book that many of us are teaching the future generations in our field, the physical biology of the cell. I'm sure that many of you know this book. And not only that, actually, for those of us who enjoy quantitative in biology, he wrote the book Cell Biology by the Numbers with Ron Milo, that is an outstanding resource for us, actually, that we go back, uh, always actually back to that when we need actually to get some numbers. So, so he is now a professor at Caltech. He is, uh, he's an extraordinary inflation, as I said, but he didn't start like this, and I want to explain a very little story. So he, he dropped off high school. I don't know if you, many of you know this story, but it's actually great, so I'm gonna say it actually. So he dropped off high school, um, and then actually he went on to, to, travel the, to travel the seas on a sailing boat, and actually he took a van, actually, and, and, and for seven years, actually, he was traveling, and actually he was working as an electrician, and he passed from that to grad student. He apparently, at some point, he thought that there was something more he wanted to explore, he was, so he went to grad student, and I have not seen of a stronger phase transition than going from electrician to grad student <laughs> in, a, in, in that time frame, actually. So, so I think, actually, what he likes to do, really, he always enjoys helping the students, actually, move on in the field. This is, actually, what he enjoys the most, and talking, actually, to other scientists, and we can see it here, being, actually, with us, and we're super happy to have you, and also with the books that he, actually, have, um, have done, actually, they're helping actually the field move forward. So thank you very much for being here. Without further ado, Rob Phillips. How dare you? <laughs> yeah. It's totally cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty loud, so I'm a little suspicious of the microphone. I think I'd be fine without it. But anyway, it's a huge pleasure, a huge honor to be here. Um, many of you that know me know that I say all the time that there's nowhere I'd rather be for science of the living matter than in Dresden. 
it's totally sincere. It's not something I say when I'm dressed and I change my mind and when I'm in the next place. So it's a great privilege to be here. Um, so a few of you have seen this before, but you know, being a keynote speaker is weird, and I, who knows what to do. I've interviewed a number of people in this room. What should a keynote speaker do? I have no idea. Uh, I got interesting insights from Stefan. I bugged Rita all last week. We were together in Greece. Um, I've asked many people, and I've always liked this thing. I liked it a lot more when I was younger, but so check it out. The y-axis is percentage effort. The x-axis is age. So when you're, you know, a young age, most of your time is spent working. And then in the middle years, I'll sort of pick on Hernan Garcia's age group. Then you fly around and you eat. And then when you get to be my, in my realm, what you do is you talk. You blah, blah. So anyway, uh, I will do my best to try to digest the things that were told to me. So I have a plan that basically has three parts. So the first part's going to be relatively philosophical and is a bunch of subjective opinions about the future of the life sciences. And I th throw them out there in the hope that over the course of this week, we will debate these six propositions which I'm offering as to what the physical approach might bring to the study of the living. And then the main thing that I'll have to say is in the middle where I'll tell you about our attempts to try to decipher the genomic Rosetta Stone. I will explain what I mean by that, why I think it's a great problem of our time. And then at the end, if I have time, I'll say a little bit about why I want to do the middle part because I view that as an annoying thing so that we can do our real job. So that's the plan. So I start with my first proposition. So many of you probably know that Darwin made this remark about mathematics being like an extra sense. And I want to build on that. So there's, a, there's an amazing book, maybe some of you have read it, by Ed Yong, called An Immense World. I'm a little embarrassed to use this word here in a bunch, with a bunch of German speakers, but in like 1910 or so, this word Umwelt was introduced to talk about our perceived environment. And I, I can't say how important this is for we humans to realize. So one example is from Roger Payne, one of my heroes. I know about him from Wales, but he started out Wales as in cetaceans, not the country. So he started out working on barn owls, but he's really known for his work on cetaceans. And the video that you see on the bottom, or the film strip, is of a barn owl in total blackness, and it's in the process of attacking a mouse. And it knows what the, where the long axis is, and it knows where the head is, all just on the basis of sound. So the notion of Umwelt is, this, is what is the external environment as we perceive it? And I think no example drives this home more than dolphins. So let me try to explain this experiment to you. So let's start in the upper left. You see the dolphin, it's basically stuck in a ring. And out in front of it, about eight meters away, you see the words standard and non-standard. That is two cylinders. They're 17 centimeters tall. Their diameter is around six centimeters. And it's an annulus. That means there's an outer and an inner radius. So it's a hollow cylinder. And the graph in the upper right is the dolphin answering the question, which one is the standard, as opposed to which one is the not standard? Note that the resolution is 0.3 millimeters. This goes on and on and on. A sperm whale goes to 1,000 meters. It can find a, a giant squid. It's an environment to us that is both black and silent, and yet to a whale, it's teeming with activity. And so that's this notion of Umwelt. And so what I want to say, I want to sort of echo Darwin in noting that by using physical approaches, it's not that we need to be patriots to physical approaches, but they expand our umwelt. And in fact, that's what I think my job as a college prof professor is, to take 18-year-olds who show up thinking, yes, I want to be a computer scientist and I want to make six digits. Sorry, that's what I hear lots. And try to convince them maybe you should read Moby Dick. And perhaps that will be exciting. And you'll change your mind about what you're going to do with your life. So that was proposition number one. And just at the lower right, maybe some of you saw, there's a very sad beluga whale that's cruising around in Scandinavia right now. It's sad. It's literally sad. It was trained by the Russians as a spy. I know this very well. I grew up in San Diego as a surfer on Point Loma. And if you ever go there and you go to the Gabriel National Monument, you go down by the lighthouse, you'll see some circular tanks. And we surfers call that place dolphin tanks. It's where the US Navy trains dolphins. OK, this is, this is no joke. You know, it's a 70-year it's a proposition. OK, proposition number two is, what is the nature of what we think of when we use the words understanding? 
And so I love this quote from Schrodinger's What is Life, where he says, how can the events in space and time, which take place within the spatial boundary of a living organism, be accounted for by physics and chemistry? And so for me, it all comes down to those two words. I'm not going to show you the videos. I mean, I'm imagining most of you have seen all of them. The first one is MS2 in bacteria, transcription. The second one is the famed David Rogers video. The third one is, uh, is either zebrafish or frog. I can't remember, but perfectly synchronous, beautiful thing. But let's think about what does Schrodinger mean when he uses words like to account for. So let's use his example, which is spectral lines. So for all of you that are feeling like it, I'd like you to take a picture of the screen right now. I'm giving you a homework for this week. Amuse yourselves. Figure out what that constant R is. Everything you need is right up there. So R is the Rydberg constant. Balmer was a high school teacher at an all-girls school. He was a mathematician. And he looked for the empirical regularities in spectral lines. And what I want you to note is that there was a coefficient called R, which we now call the Rydberg constant, which you will determine empirically just by taking the wavelengths taking the one over the wavelength and then using two integers, and you'll get an R. What's amazing is that some years later, Erwin Schrodinger wrote this paper, 1926, and if you look in the upper right, you'll see that he has now figured out the Rydberg constant. It's not an empirical constant. He has accounted for spectral lines on the basis of wave functions. You know, there's many ways for us to think about it, quantization of angular momentum, certain number of integral wavelengths in an orbit or whatever, but at the end of the day, for me, the parts that the most mind-blowing of all is that the Rydberg constant involves fundamental constants of nature. That's what Schrodinger had in mind when he talked about accounting for the life phenomenon. And in a way, we just heard from the rector's comments that there may be new physical things for us to learn in thinking about the living. But I, above all, want to emphasize this notion of what does it mean to understand something. Okay, proposition number three. The weird way in which things that we thought were different are the same. So, lots of you have seen me give lectures before in which I uh, teach diffusion, and I'm gonna do it right now. So, born on an even day or an odd day? Odd. Even or odd? Your birthday. See what's happening? So I'm doing a random walk. Hi. And uh, the random walk is described by the green function, shown there at the lower, lower left. That tells us the concentration as a function of position, as a function of time. And the width of the distribution that I would get by doing the birthday question grows as the square root of the number of times I ask that question. Cool. That's diffusion. Now I take a string of paper clips, of n paper clips, and I drop it on this table, and then I measure the radius, and I do it a bunch of times, and I do it again for a longer chain, and I measure the radius. What will I find? I will find that the size of that blob scales with the square root of the number of paper clips. So diffusion and polymers are the same. Ditto for RLC circuits and a pendulum, and you know I can go on and on and on like this. So I believe, you know, we spend a lot of time in biology thinking about diversity. That's awesome. I love that. That's why I go to Indonesia and why I go to New Zealand and why I go to the Galapagos. So I don't want to be lectured on not appreciating diversity. But what about unity? What is, what is biological that can be thought of as being the same? And I would posit that the Alistairi phenomenon is one of the biggest examples of sameness that one can possibly imagine. So here I throw you, show you three examples, and I've got way more. So the upper left is chemotaxis receptors. That's the work of Bonnie Bassler and Ned Wingreen. And what I want you to see in the bottom is that that data collapse that they show is very weird and unusual. It does not involve a fit. There is not a fit. The data collapse simply comes down to knowing what the right degrees of freedom are. The middle one has to do with, uh, sorry, yeah, the first one was chemotaxis, the second one is cor quorum sensing. And the third one has to do with gene expression, and all of them are the same underlying statistical physics of allosteric molecules. Even though if you look in the Fat Albert's book, they might be 400 pages apart. In principle, you could have a chapter of that book, which is allosteric, and have GPCRs, hemoglobin, ligand gate ion channels, transcription factors, allosteric enzymes, nucleosomes, all in the same chapter. 
they're all the same, despite the fact that the labs that work on them might be in different buildings or on different campuses. Okay, proposition four. This one I imagine might be among the most controversial that I'm gonna make, uh, but good. So hopefully people will, will build on this. So let me be exaggerated and say, I dream of a biology without sequences and structures. Okay, that's just to be annoying. So people come and talk to me and you know, try to understand what I mean by that. But so what's the point? Sometimes when people tell me, how could you possibly be talking about this biological phenomenon and not mention molecules? What I say to them is, how could you possibly be talking about molecules and not mention quarks? Sorry, conversation over. Can't talk to you, you didn't mention quarks. You're not serious. It's supposed to be kind of funny. <laughs> I mean, obviously I don't believe that. But that is the intellectual content of somebody telling you that if you don't ex examine the structure of the relevant proteins, that you're not doing serious science. So I think this notion of mechanism is a very deep one. And I personally think, this is lots of subjective opinions, I think it's deeply flawed to always be looking for molecular interpretations of things. So in 1972, Philip Anderson wrote this article which is, to my mind, one of the best epistemological statements about the conduct of science that I know of. It's called More is Different. And his idea is that X, subject X, is not just applied Y. It's not true that the nature of cloud patterns and convection roles is just applied quantum chromodynamics. Give me a break. There is a borderline nothing that those theories can say about clouds. There's no such thing as superconductivity of a single electron or whatever. So, you know, the, so what I like in showing here is, you know, when we think about elasticity or hydrodynamics, we dispense with the molecules. And so I'm very amused with the idea of the physical approach telling us how to do X without Y. So here's six examples. The two on the left, I guess, are not really very biological, but there are biological incarnations of that done by those guys right there, <laughs> you know, the field theory types from Dresden, these guys, they think about discretizing th elastic and viscous media, getting rid of the molecules and representing them by field theories. In the middle, things like the toner two theory tell us how to do flocking without birds or thinking about cytoskeletal motion without actin. In the top right, you could think, and maybe Ernan will tell us about this, you can think about embryos without cells or allosteria without molecules. So all of those are examples of mechanism in which you don't necessarily appeal to the underlying things. Okay, next on the list is formalizing our null hypotheses. So Jeremy Guna Wardena has this beautiful paper on our pathetic thinking, and I think, you know, every student that I can, I talk, talk to them about that, because, you know, what is a hypothesis? It's a dumbass guess. You know, you make a guess. Usually you're wrong. Lamarck was wrong. We make fun of him, but he was really, there's a statue to him in the Jardin des Plantes for a reason, because he was a great biologist. So we make dumbass guesses, and so here I'm showing you four of them. So in the upper left, you know, you imagine that molecular motors are, they, they, wait, they have a certain rate, and they wait a certain time, and I, I will end up with an exponential distribution. I can go measure it and ask whether that's what we see. Um, you know, the, the examples go on and on. I guess I won't really bore you with them, but one of the things related to what my real subject is today is that when we look at gene expression, the stupidest model that we can imagine is constitutive expression, meaning the gene's just a factory producing RNA at a rate R. If you do that, you'll, it leads to a Poisson distribution. So you can just ask, if I go measure gene expression noises at Poisson, sometimes, usually not. So that leads to a second model, which is an empirical model, a phenomenological model of two states, as you see right there. And so I'm just trying to say that when we mathematicize our hypotheses, often it leads to a distribution. That distribution helps us see things which we would not see otherwise. It expands our umwelt. And then perhaps the most important of all, so this is the one that I feel most hung up on in interacting with reviewer three, is, uh, is the notion of surprise and what we care about. And I guess I would just argue that conceptual knowledge versus factual knowledge are very different things. So every surfer knows that tides are higher at full moon. That is not science. It's a factual statement. It's knowledge, but it's not very good. It's 
I mean, it's good if you care about when to go surfing, but it's not very good in terms of what gives rise to tides. You would never explain from that why the Gulf of Tonkin has one high tide and one low tide per day. That's weird. You go to San Diego, I'm telling you, there's two high tides and two low tides per day, but that's not true in the Gulf of Tonkin. Why? So, um, so at any rate, I think that's very important. And, you know, you might laugh at this book on the left. Like, nobody would take this seriously as something they'd go look at right now. So I, I don't know. I, maybe I will read the title. Massachusetts Institute of Technology Wavelength Tables with Intensities in Arc, Spark, or Discharge Tube of more than 100,000 spectrum lines most strongly emitted by the atomic elements under normal conditions of excitation between 10,000 angstroms and 2,000 angstroms arranged in order of decreasing wavelengths. So, you know, it's factual knowledge. Interestingly, Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin at Harvard University used the 60,000 photographic plates of spectral lines, factual knowledge, to figure out that stars are made of hydrogen and helium. She brooked the whole field by telling people like Henry Norris Russell, who thought the composition of stars was basically like the composition of the Earth, that they were wrong. And she used this kind of factual knowledge to develop conceptual knowledge, which is the composition of stars. So, you know, you might laugh at that, but that's big data back in the day. And there's a theory that helps us understand a conceptual thing. And I guess my question is, you know, what kind of conceptual things can we say about any of the sort of big data things that arise nowadays? And I just wanted to comment, you know, this is something um, that's very cool that Arnon did. Uh, so if you look on the right, using MS2, you can either put the MS2 on the three prime or the five prime end of an mRNA, and that means there's a time delay. And I'm just amused by the fact that shown on the left, in the lifetime of Newton, Romer was able to measure the speed of light by noticing that the time it takes Io to cross Jupiter was shorter when we were closer to Jupiter than when we were not. The diameter of the Earth's orbit is 300,000, 300, um, what am I, no, three, 300 million uh, kilometers. And so you can figure out it was like a 20 minute difference that they measured, if you can imagine, the 1670s. 20 minute difference in the eclipse time. So, uh, so at any rate, I, I just, I love this notion of conceptual knowledge. So just to end this part of my talk, I guess what I would say is that I don't really like to fly the flag of biology or physics. I'm perfectly happy to be an ignoramus in both of those fields. Um, at, but I think that, that the fields are giving gifts to each other. And if I had to speculate, you know, not everybody would agree with this, but I think biology is giving a bigger gift to physics than the other way around. That's my personal take. Okay, so that's the end of the first part. Um, I think I'm doing fine on time. So now let me tell you about this genomic Ros Rosetta Stone. So now I'm going to dig into something concrete and particular, specifics. Um, Schrodinger had two things that he was worried about, about the nature of the living. One of them was heredity and the nature of the genome. It led him to an amazing estimate. And I'll just tell you, just as an aside. He wanted to know how big a gene was, how many atoms are in a gene. And there were a bunch of different ways that he tried to measure it. Most of them were flawed in the same way that people tried to measure the age of the Earth, like, for example, by looking at sedimentation rates of rivers or the degree of salinity of the ocean. It's a great idea. It just doesn't work. And so he looked at banded patterns and chromosomes. That was one of his methods, and he had others. But then the main method that worked was x-rays and mutagenesis. And he knew essentially what the cross-section for mutagenesis was. And his point was, if, an, if a gene is only 1,000 atoms or 10,000 atoms, what about 1 over root n fluctuations? Why is it that Hox genes are more stable than the Himalayas? You know, he was worried about that. The Earth is less stable than a gene in some sense. And so he, he said, well, statistical physics doesn't really work in some sense. So at any rate, the nature of heredity was one of his things. The other was the physical chemical nature of life. I like that problem more, frankly, but today I'm going to tell you about the genome problem because I think there's very interesting things to say. So, my talk is really predicated upon this very simple question to all of you. What do those 100 letters mean? They're part of the E. coli genome. And until a few years ago, zero people could answer that question. So, you know, this, I guess, really bothers me. <laughs> so if you look at this, this is the, uh, the sequence read archive at the NIH. It's now over, t I think, over 10 to the 17th letters deposited. Just to put it in perspective, the 37 plays of Shakespeare, each of which is, you know, something like the length of Hamlet, 
uh, is around one, uh, the complete works of Shakespeare is one bacterial genome, six million letters. If you convert that into numbers of books, then the Library of Congress, the US Library of Congress has about 50 million books. This is a factor of 10 to the fourth more letters. And the reason I say that that bothers me is, you know, in some sense, um, you know, every morning, machine learning, I wake up and Amazon is asking me to spend more money, which I do. I spend money most days, like l literally almost twice, three, four times a week, I spend money. And so I'm filling up my, my iPad with more books that I don't have time to read. And that's fine. And, you know, the machine learning is good until two things happen. Either they tell me, they send me a picture of a guy without a shirt on and long hair and it's some romance novel because my, I like happy ending type books. I'm an American, you know, I like those. But it seems to slide. The machine learning keeps sliding towards the shirtless guy. And then I'm like, okay, I gotta get these people back on track. Then they also offer me a book that I wrote. And then I, I, f I feel like, you know, that's really not such a good algorithm. We think you might like The Molecular Switch. I am so tired of that book. I really don't want anything to do with it. My editor at Cambridge once told me, you're the first author that ever told me that you'd like your book to be in a chest at the bottom of the ocean when you, I asked you to do a second edition. <laughs> so, so anyway, it, it's, I find that very bothersome for the following reason. So we have this genomic encyclopedia. And there are parts of it that we're very good at. You might think that we're very good at it in general, but we're not. It's like me buying my books on Amazon in a language I don't speak. That's really the situation. Let me try to demonstrate that. So obviously, parts of the genome, the parts having to do with the protein coding regions, we're very good at understanding and deciphering what those things mean. But the 100 letters that I just offered you, they're super boring. They're nothing more than the promoter region of a particular purine synthesis gene in E. coli, like really not that sophisticated. I mean, in some sense, deeply sophisticated, but not some surprising weird thing about strange physiology or whatever. It's just a garden variety feedback. So let me, let me try to drive home this point. So here I offer you five organisms, and let's just take a survey for kicks. How many of you think that the best understood one is the one in the upper left? There's not a single person. That, I find that at, at least a little surprising because in the US often there are some subset of people that raise their hand here because of the huge medical apparatus of our field. I mean, a lot is known about humans even though we are confused, clearly. Um, how many people think it's Drosophila? Are you not participating or like? <laughs> this is a first. Yeast? Okay, that's cool. C. elegans? I was going to say, <laughs> if you didn't raise your hand, I was going to, you're fired. <laughs> All right, and then uh, what about E. coli? All right, so I'm on the E. coli side, but it doesn't matter because what I'm going to say is the same for all of them. So let's focus on the upper left. So this is something that Ernan and I, uh, with uh, one of his students, have been up to, which is try to survey the, the databases of genomes and try to understand what we know about the extent of their regulation. So what I'm showing you up there is what fraction of the genes we know nothing, meaning no binding sites, no transcription factors. We don't know how that gene of interest is regulated. And you can see that in the case of E. coli, it's more than 60% of genes. For other organisms, it's worse. For non-model organisms, forget it. Similarly, in E. coli, for 30% of the genes, we don't know what they do meaning we don't know what the protein is for. So, you know, that's, in a cer certain sense, I would say, very problematic. So, said differently, diagrams like this are the exception. They're not the rule. They're the result of generations and generations of PhD theses. So, the one on the left is the classic, you know, starting with people like Vichaus and Nusslein Volhard, but that's a description of the long axis patterning, for example, in Drosophila. The one on the right is near and dear to my heart because that's something that Eric Davidson worked very hard on in the context of the sea urchin. And he was not messing around when he made these diagrams look like this. In other words, he had an idea. He wanted to present a notion of regulation like an electronic circuit. So the reality is shown on the lower right. In other words, we're used to our books showing us pictures like the ones on the left, but the reality is like on the right. 
So um, what I'm kind of keen on in the context of bacteria, but also eukaryotes, is what's the nature of the regulatory architectures that are exploited by organisms? And what's the evolutionary story behind it? So what I'm showing you here, let's imagine a notation which I call M comma N. M means that there are M activator binding sites, and N means there are N repressor binding sites. On the right, I'm showing you a histogram of looking at the databases with the proviso that I think 0, 0 is false meaning it's just a statement of ignorance as opposed to a statement of what biological reality is actually like, meaning that this is way overrepresents constitutive expression. So the goal that I'm going to try to walk you through is how can we figure out how to dissect what the meaning of these promoters is. In other words, what's the nature of a promoter that we know nothing about? And this is a high throughput method. The hope, I will tell you at the end, is that my friend Victoria Orphan will go down in the submersible alphan to the ocean floor, she will extract some sediment, and in a week we'll have not only the genome, but the full regulatory architecture. So that's kind of the objective. It needs to be a high throughput thing. And so I'm gonna try to walk you through this protocol, and the outcome of the protocol, just so that you're clear on what the objective is, is a cartoon like the one I show on the lower right, and an energy matrix. When I say energy matrix, it means I can compute from first principles what the strength of binding is for polymerase, activators, repressors, and so on. Okay, so let me try to walk you through this. So what we did is, uh, as a first proof of principle, we looked at 100 genes, we've done more since, but the idea was choose 20 for which generations of molecular biologists have already figured out how they're regulated, choose 80 for which we know nothing, and let it rip. So here's how this works. So the first thing that we do is we construct a library of mutagenized promoters where the pr promoter is mutagenized at the 10% level. That means of the 200 base pairs in a promoter regulatory region, we mutagenize 20 of them. And we do it over and over again. And then what we do is we barcode these things and we put them into cells. And then we grow them under many, many different conditions. And then we count how many mRNAs there are as a function of which mutations were present. So I could take a book, some book like Moby Dick, and I could mutagenize it at the 10% level. Certain letters, don't matter. For example, in the word wall or walk, I can mutagenize the A, you will still know that it's the word walk. There are no letters that can replace A in walk and have it still be a sensible English word. But if I mutagenize the K, you don't know whether it's wall or walk, for example. So that letter matters. So what we're doing this is by doing the sequencing, we can use information theory to generate a map of meaning. The histogram you see on the right is a map that tells you which base pairs matter and which pair base pairs don't. The red ones we associate with, uh, with a, an increase in expression, which means we think we mutagenized part of a repressor binding site, and the blue ones led to a decrease in expression, which means we mutagenized either an activator site or an RNA polymerase site. So now we have a hypothesis about where transcription factors bind, but we don't know who binds there. And so the next step is to, um, we'll come back to that in a minute, the next step is to actually take that putative binding site, attach it to a magnetic bead, break open cells, let them try to bind, and then use mass spec to identify them. So that's the protocol. So let me try to give you a sense of this. So the first thing I wanna say is, is how did we exploit ideas of information theory, like I just mentioned in the context of the word walk? So this is Claude Shannon. You probably, many of you know about the, the history of Bell Labs. If you haven't read the book, The Idea Factory, I highly recommend it to you to see what a, a great lab is like. And actually, you know, there's some version of this. Tony, you know, and you and I talked about this last week in Dresden. What makes this place tick? You know, I think it's worth all of you thinking about what makes dis different places tick and what makes some places, no matter how much money you throw at them, they do not become magic. What's that all about? So Shannon was interested in long distance communication. And to me, he's the Carnot of information in the, same, in the sense that Carnot said, yeah, there's a German version of a steam engine, there's an English version of a steam engine, there's a French version, it doesn't matter. They all will obey me, <laughs> meaning Carnot, there's a principle. And in, this, in the case of, Carnot, of Shannon, he wrote down principles of how to think about information. And just to give you a sense of it, if we take the last paragraph of On the Origin of Species, there's grandeur in this view of life, et cetera, 
and we work out the frequency of the letters shown there, the first thing you can learn is the nature of the, um, the number of points on tiles in Scrabble in English, right? That's the first thing that you'll learn. And I'm going to point at these, these three guys who all have Spanish as a native tongue. And I suspect, but I'm not sure, that Q is not that big a deal in Scrabble. Do you guys know? What's wrong with these guys? <laughs> guys, come on. All right, whatever. That was disappointing. Um, all right. V in German in Scrabble? You guys don't know either. All right, this is not a, this is not a fun crowd. You need to play more Scrabble. Get out of the lab. So, um, so what's shown on the right is actually quite a bit more interesting. That is, if I have a current letter T, what's the next letter going to be? You know, there's a correlation between letters. And so that is what the mutual information is relevant for because it tells me the relationship between if I, if I have a Y, what's the next letter? And since we're all, you know, in a complete tizzy fit about chat GPT, I assure you that that's part of the story of word to vec, you know, this kind of thing. It has to do with what's correlated with what. And, you know, it's, it's very interesting. Like, think about the word blue. So the word blue is a very interesting word in the English language. And it's a word that means a color, but I also love it. It's the kind of word my mom might use to talk about a mood. It's much rarer, but it's a very good, I'm in a kind of a blue mood, frankly. Like I am, so it even works. So this is telling us about the mutual information. So when you use this on these gene expression problems, so here's a well-known gene that all of you know and love, I presume, the LAC operon. These peaks tell you where the binding sites are for the activator CRP, for the repressor LAC I, and for the polymerase. Because when you mutagenize them, the level of gene expression changes, meaning there's mutual information. I'm tempted to write on the board, but there's mutual information between base I being an A, C, G, or T, and which bin of gene expression you show up in. That's the sense in which we're using mutual information. OK, so out of this comes an energy matrix. I'm not going to talk about this, but let me just, as a provocation, say it's pretty damn cool that we think we know how to design binding sites. You, you want me to dial in a certain strength of binding using statistical physics, we can add up bases in a way to get in KBT units a certain binding energy. So that'll come back maybe a little at the end. So I've told you about identifying binding sites, but I haven't told you who binds there. And it's a needle in a haystack problem. And so you know, I'm very amused by this guy. He's uh, Sven Sachsalber. And this was in the museum in Paris. And what he did is he actually dumped a bale of hay. He had the curator of the museum put a needle in it. He had a webcam. And then you could either go watch on direct, you know, like go to the museum, or you could watch it online as he found the needle in the haystack. So that is the problem that we are faced with. And I'm going to try and demonstrate it to you. If you take one of these two cubic meter Monet haystacks, I'm going to claim that it has on the order of 10 to the seventh pieces of hay. It's a homework for you. That long, that diameter, divide the total volume by that size, and you'll get on the order of 10 to the seventh. That's roughly how many proteins there are per micron cubed in whatever. But I'm thinking about E. coli. It's true for yeast. It's true for Dros Drosophila, whatever. It's of order few times 10 to the six proteins per micron cubed. How many transcription factors are there? Well, it's very interesting. I mean, I'm not sure how many of you know this, but the number of transcription factors of each type in E. coli is of order 10, which is to say 10 nanomolar. So what I'm showing you at the top is the total number of proteins in E. coli as a function of growth rate on the x-axis. Faster growing cells have more proteins. The next one is the total number of transcription factors. They're of order 300 different transcription factors. And the bottom is the number of copies of LAC I of order 10. So we're trying to find 10 out of a total of 10 to the 7th proteins. And so the way we do that, as I said before, is Nathan had this idea of making an oligo that has the putative binding site. He breaks, breaks open the cells. He washes them across these magnetic beads. We pull out the magnetic bead. We run mass spec. And we get a, a big enrichment 
of the one of interest, which you see here is um, pure R. So now I can finally come back to my original question, which is this. It turns out that that's a bit of sequence from a gene involved in purine synthesis. Just as a, an aside, let's all remember Chargaff's rules. So Chargaff was a biochemist. If any of you have read The Double Helix, you might remember that Chargaff was the guy who indicated to Watson and Crick the idea that the number of A's and T's and the number of G's and C's should be the same. That sameness is very interesting from the standpoint of biological feedback. The cell cares. It cares about ATP to ADP. It also cares about purine to pyrimidine. And when they're out of balance, it turns on the genes either to increase the amount of one or the other. And that's what this gene is about. And this is for the students. Chargaff was a great intellectual from Austria, like Schrodinger, edu educated at gymnasium, new Latin, Greek, blah, 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 super well educated. He wrote an amazing autobiography called Heracletian Fire, and I admire him, but here's what he had to say. So far as I could make out, they wanted, unencumbered by any knowledge of the chemistry involved, to fit DNA into a helix. Again, for the students, who came out on the winning side of this one? And it's very often true. The people my age can tell you you don't know something or other, and it doesn't matter. And I hate to invoke Daniel Fisher in his absence, but you know, we love talking about when should you read the literature and when should you not read the literature. And there's a lot of virtue to not knowing things. And I don't know how to find that balance, you know, but it's just worth considering. So this was the before, this is the after. And just to give you a sense of it, this is a bit shock and awe, but on the right-hand side, every one of those, when we started, we knew nothing. We and everyone else knew nothing. And now we think we have a regulatory hypo hypothesis for all those genes. We have energy matrices. We can go do our real job. And that's the last part of my talk. It'll probably take me 10 minutes. Is that all right, Rita? You sure? OK. So now that we've figured out what the regulatory architectures are, what do we do with that? And so you know, the dream that I have, in a way, is I want to be able to have the calculated input-output properties of every single gene and every single organism. You know, I want to think of it as like when I open up the Art of Electronics by Horowitz and Hill, I know what a diode's IV characteristics are, a capacitor, a resistor, or whatever. I want to know what is the nature of each one of these architectures. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you about um, what Ernan and I worked on during his PhD thesis, which is how to think about the simplest of all regulatory architectures, which is simple repression. This is the original Monod and Jacob model. And I just say, again, for the students, it's very interesting. In five years, these guys went from the revolutionaries to the stodgy old timers who were haters. Five years is all it took. Because they thought all regulatory architectures were going to be simple repression. And when people started discovering activators, Jacob and Monod tried to shut them down. That happened in 1968. And this paper is 63. Like five years going from revolutionary to hater. I just find that scary, I guess I would say. So I'm not going to go through the details of the mathematics, but let me just give you a sense of what I'm trying to tell you. So a gene that's regulated by a repressor will have this kind of behavior. And what I mean by that is if you look at the y-axis, that's level of gene expression. The x-axis is number of repressors. Let's make sure we're all on board with this. If I increase the number of repressors, I should get less gene expression, right? There's nothing weird or off about that. And it's got a certain functional form. The functional form is shown right here. It's incredibly simple. 1 over 1 plus the number of repressors divided by the size of the genome times e to the minus how tightly the repressor binds. That's what the theory predicts. So we need to find on the x-axis number of repressors, and we have to on the y-axis measure level of gene expression. And this raises uh, the specter of AU. How many of you have written a paper that had A.U? Thank you. So I like your pride. So uh, arbitrary units. Note that our equation does not feature arbitrary units. It features number of repressors. So somehow we need a standard candle. We need to figure out how to go between intensity and number. And my favorite example of standard candle is the work of Henrietta Leavitt. So I just want to call your attention to the same group that Cecilia Pankaposhkin was part of. Check it out. That's 1910, Boston, Cambridge, I guess you call it. 
Look at the graph. It's amazing. What is it? It's the intensity of Cepheid variable stars. Cepheid variable stars, like that one, are stars that get bri bright and then dim, bright and dim, bright and dim, and they do it with perfect periodicity. And her discovery was the lower right. There's a simple relationship between absolute magnitude and periodicity. So if you measure a certain periodicity, you measure an apparent magnitude, you know the absolute magnitude because it's like me telling you I'm carrying around a 100 watt light bulb. Wherever I go, if you know it's a 100 watt light bulb, you can figure out how far away I am by inverse square law. That's a standard candle. If you're interested, go look, just type in on Google Cepheid Variables Hubble Telescope, and you will see it was a key part of the, the Hubble mission, and they cal recalibrated the Cepheid Variables. You know, they're really, really powerful standard candles. So, Michael Elowitz, Uri Alon, and in particular Jonathan Young and Nitzan Rosenfeld had this wonderful idea, which was the following. If I have a small number of transcription factors, and they're fluorescently labeled, and the cell divides, if the f out of the four of you, if you're born on an even day, please raise your hand. Three out of four, that means three transcription factors went to one daughter, one transcription factor went to the other daughter. That means the intensity of the two cells is not the same. Are we all cool on that? So I look at the intensities of the two daughters, and by measuring those fluctuations, we can determine the unknown coefficient alpha. Let's just make sure we're clear on what the coefficient is. I'm offering the hypothesis, intensity is linearly related to number of repressors. All I'm missing is the factor that relates them linearly, alpha. And what I'm showing you at the bottom is this amazing equation, nothing more than binomial theorem to work it out, and it says that if you take the square of the difference between the daughters, it's related to the intensity of the mother, and this unknown coefficient shows up. Super cool. So this is what an experiment looks like. So you basically have these cells, they're dividing. They originally were red because they were full of repressors. As the repressors get diluted out, the gene that they're controlling, which is green, goes up. So every cell division is a point on this graph. So let's go on the x-axis. That's the intensity of the mother. I take the difference of the intensity of the daughters and square it. So now I've got my two Cartesian coordinates. And the slope of that line tells you 156 arbitrary units per molecule. And that means we can do this. And I'm just telling you, you'll have to take my word for it. I'm imagining that some fraction of you don't believe me for real, but those curves were drawn before the experiment was done. And you know, I like to kiddingly say that I can replace the axes with physics words and go give a physics colloquium, and no one will know that I'm talking about a biological experiment instead of a condensed matter experiment. That's the possibilities for the state of the art, I guess. So, um, so that's cool. Um, we worked really hard to do a lot of different kinds of predictions, so let me just say, like, here is a prediction in which we put decoys. Those plasmids that you see are decoys in the sense that they bind repressors, but they have no value. They're just rep they just are decoys, and they suck repressors out of, out of circulation. But it leads to an interesting structure in the log-log graph. And then we made the measurements, shown here. And this took like 15 years. I'm telling you this for a reason, because we thought we were so clever and we were working so hard over and over and over again until we realized that we just kept doing the same experiment because there was a hidden variable. If we'd known about the hidden variable, we just did one experiment. So let's talk about hidden variables for a second. So Joe Keller wrote this great paper if I take a coin and I flip it like this, uh, you know, I take something, I throw it up. There's probably too much air resistance on this, but the travel time is two times the initial velocity up divided by little g. So I know how long the coin is in the air. If I know omega, the rotational frequency, and I multiply it by t, I figure out how many times it flipped. And so these blue and red things are telling you whether it's heads or tails. So there's a hidden dimensionless variable, which allows you to know whether it was heads or tails. And in our case, we have a hidden variable too. So what I'm telling you is that the way I like to think of it, in the lab, we have all sorts of pipetters variables. And this is what everybody comes to my office. I mean, this guy and I, we talked endlessly. 
like just never stopped. How do you tune the number of repressors? How do you know the quantitative westerns worked? What do you think about the fluorescence? Did the photo bleaching work? He and I did 800 by hand on Skype together while my wife was asleep. So we were, in, we were both talking at 6,000 miles apart, you know, working really, really hard at the pipettors variables. And then only to realize later on that the pipettors variables are not what the cell cares about. The cell has its own concerns. There's many ways to get to the same hyperplane of expression, and that's what's shown here. If somebody wants to know about it in the questions, I'll tell you. So, you know, for me, this is what I think of as reading the genome. It means that we can make predictions, as shown on the left. Those predictions, we can, maybe they're borne out by experiments, or maybe not. Like, you know, a question I'm always wondering is, is it worth asking somebody in their 20s to figure out whether the blue and the green dots are too far or too close to the theory curve? Is that worth somebody's 20s? For so far, the answer is no. Um, just to say again, you know, the dream is with Victoria for her to go down in Alvin, to bring back some sediment, and to try to actually do a whole genome in a week. Um, so, you know, what I, what I want to imagine is, in a way, the point of today's talk was we don't really know the grammar. So how can we write the poetry of the genome in the absence of the grammar? And then my, just my last thought is I wanted to just say, probably to the embarrassment of a few in the, you in the room or surprise, um, we've done so many things. There already are huge numbers of success stories. And I could call out others, you know, like I have to say, calling out Kinneret. I love the things that they've been doing on Hydra. Every time I think of it, you know, I'm just excited. I feel like quitting what I'm doing to work on it. So, you know, here are four examples that I really love. So, the upper left, I think you're right up there. <laughs> Graduate, uh, somebody in this room, I hope, uh, was working on this very beautiful thing of optogenetically controlling um, junction lengths. And that I love. I already told you about Bonnie Bassler and Ned Wengreen. This is a super deep paper where they were looking at quorum sensing and they were able to use the method of data collapse to figure out the nature of mutants. They didn't know what the mutants were, but they could, using sort of the physical dissection, figure out what they were about. Um, you know, I'm a Absolute enormous fan of this experiment, Joe. You know the KIP three thing. Like what? <laughs> Your mind is always in the gutter. <laughs> I had never before now known that that's what that was called, but uh, I will keep that. To, I will keep that to myself in the future. But for the rest of you, that is the famous underpants graph. Yeah, and then uh, I, I don't, uh, again, I don't know how many of you have ever looked at this, but this goes back, I think, to Joel Rosenbaum, but these are really, um, the upper right is clammy. So what Rosenbaum originally, but Wallace Marshall has got a sort of demonic sense of humor. Like he has the, he knows how to make high throughput weirdness. Like he has a high throughput guillotine for cut, cutting stentor. And then looking at, you know, how that, that develops again, a bit akin to what the things that Kinneret thinks about. But this experiment blows my mind. You have clammy, you cut off one of the arms, and what happens is this arm shrinks, the other one starts growing until they get to the same length and they go to a new uh, value. So um, anyway, it's just to say that, that I think that this physical approach is very useful, and with that, I, you know, I, above all, I think I want to thank Bill Ireland, shown in the upper right, um, Aaron, who is here with us, and Nathan Beliveau, who really uh, got this reg seek thing that I told you about going. I'm very happy that I'm through, and now I can meet with you. I'd just like to say, especially for the students, um, that I would love to chat and hear what you're up to. I don't like posters that much because I don't have a very good sense of being able to listen to things on a two-minute time scale and understand them, but I hope I'll have a chance to talk to as many of you as possible. And during meal meals, I will be seeking you guys out instead of the senior citizens. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot, actually, for the awesome lecture. So now we're going to open the session for questions, actually. If you have any questions, just raise your hand, and I'm going to bring the microphone or uh, somebody else. Uh, any questions? Come on, first the, first the students. Don't be shy. It's not shy. You've seen it. So. <laughs>
I, am a, I actually am kind of shy, but okay, it doesn't come across. If you don't have questions, I'll start with a hard one. Oh, one okay, I can see one up there. Uh, okay. Are you going? Um, so the microphone is going to reach you, maybe. What, what does fugacity mean? Yeah, it's, a, it's uh, as many cool ideas, something that comes from Gibbs. And what it has to do with um, is a much bigger theme. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ramble for just a moment. But what he wanted to do is he wanted to find a way to represent the nature of the reservoir. Like if I take a beer and I put it in the Pacific Ocean, I'm going to cool the beer, but I'm going to do nothing to the ocean. And so in a certain sense, if I could figure out the statistical physics of the reservoir, meaning the ocean, and never refer to the ocean, that would be a good thing. And that, we are used to that in the form of the chemical, poten chemical potential. It turns out, if you like, that the fugacity is e to the beta chemical potential. So it's related to that. And if you want to understand why that curve that I showed you worked out the way that it did, I think I can say, I think I can say it in a way that will make sense. So let's, let's look at the curves up at the upper left and cut across with a straight horizontal line. The different colors, blue, green, red, and black, are different binding strengths. And I can get the same value of gene expression by having strong binding site and low repressors, or weak binding site and lots of repressors. And the, so the fugacity is basically a measure of how many repressors there are. That's, that's how that's coming into play. Yeah. Good question. It's Andy, right? So great to see you. Go ahead. Maybe you just you should you yell. It, on, it yeah. doesn't seem to be working. Just yell. You're good. Yeah. Yeah, I love the question. And so what I'll tell you is that the way we're currently practicing it, which there's a lot to criticize, um, it is, um, shoot, yeah, here we go. So notice the equation at the bottom. It's pretending. I'm, I have a fiction, which is that each site contributes a certain amount in KBT units and is independent of whatever the neighbors are. We know that to not be true. I can tell you more about it. Like, we've done the case where you include pairs and so on. But for, as a zeroth order model, it's actually very good. Once the number of mutations in a 20 base pair uh, binding site goes above about four, you start to see errors. And it's because that context, they're starting to overlap in a way that you could call it epistasis, but the, the, they're not independent anymore. So we know about that, and it's worth thinking about. Of course, it depends on how much data you have as well. But for the moment, it is strictly a linear model, base by base, independently. Yeah. OK, any other questions? Yeah. Hey. Just yell out. <laughs> Wait, say it again? Ah, yeah, yeah. So good. So his question was, uh, is the next step to go from letters to words? and? Um, for sure, you know, when I kiddingly said that I'm excited about a, s a future with no sequences and structures, that's the kind of direction. You know, like you can think of a binding site as a word. And in a way, in StatMec, the way we represented that is with an energy epsilon. You know, in a way, that's a, a coarse graining of all that detail. So for sure, it'd be cool if we could figure out, you know, how to do something like that. Anything else? Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so you did Hi. some really cool work on a most studied organism. Yes. So how much of similar cool physics could you get out well, of, I don't know, something that happens to be really cool for biological reasons or because it's something really cool, yeah. but we don't even have a genome? Yeah, I love that. And that's really why Victoria and I have, have posed a challenge to ourselves. And you know, when people are coming to my lab now, I'm telling them, when you give your thesis defense, I hope you'll be able to talk about an organism nobody's ever heard, heard of before. We're in the little steps for little feet mode at the moment. You'll just have to be patient with us. In other words, we're still just trying to figure out what happens when there's overlapping binding sites. And can we even figure that case out in E. coli? Um, but for sure, the ambition, the next organism to go is going to be Pseudomonas, which is kind of medically relevant. But beyond that, the hope is to be able to do an adventure. You know, like on the 10-year time scale, my hope and goal is to be, 
be able to do whatever organism A to Z. It's hard. So we're at little steps, little feet mode. Anything else? Any other questions? Now, not from students, from anyone. Okay, so I'm gonna ask then a question. Okay, so imagine actually that we were able to do exactly what you're saying, like find all the regulatory logic, find all yeah. the elements for any organism. Yeah. So the question that keeps me up at night actually, and that hopefully I think many people hear as well, is where is the information about phenotype? So imagine yeah. actually, can you actually, is really in those connections, is really in the, in the topology of the connections or we, or the some other level of abstraction actually where the information lies? Yeah, and I, I, don't, I don't know the answer at all. Um, of, of course, I'm interested in the same thing. And you know, uh, I guess all I can say is that by building up some sort of intuition for, uh, from the phenomenology, the hope is that maybe we'll see regularities that we're able to make some sense of. But l let me just comment for everybody about these diagrams, you know, which I'm a great fan of, but nevertheless, you know, they are, they are very deceptive. So one of the worst parts about them is they include no information about allosteric effectors. So we know, like if you look at number of papers on metabolome, proteome, transcriptome since 2000, they're all doing this. If you look up allosterome, it's flat. There's no, basically, how to, in a high throughput fashion, figure out what the effectors are. We're really bad at it. And I would say 60, 70% of proteins are perturbed by the binding of some small effector molecule. So, you know, like to me, even for us to do this, we have to figure out what things get the gene of interest to go on. And it's not at all obvious. Yeah, and it worked very well for the case of Davidson, actually, for yeah. this, but it's just like uh, at the end of the day, it's a switch yeah. of state. But actually, when you look at more complex phenotypes. Well, so, you know, as you, I'm sure you know, when Ron Milo was with Uri Alon, you know, they tried, to, they tried to characterize genomes in the sense of how many feed forwards are there of each kind. And that's kind of the dream here. It's like, can we flesh out one of these diagrams? And then, you know, Aranon likes to say, I don't know if he will say it in his talk today, but, you know, if he got rid of the left-hand side and just show, and got rid of the names, there's just no way that you know that that's a fly, or at least not that I do. Maybe there's somebody in this room that does, but he doesn't, and I don't. You know, in other words, how do you know from that architecture, you know, that anything, the long axis, patterns, seven, you know, like any of it. Little, can I say little steps for little feet again? You can say whatever you want. <laughs> okay, any other question? All right. No? Let's have a break. So let's have it here. Oh, oh sorry, sorry, my name is Cassandra. Hi, Cassandra. Sorry, I couldn't see you. <laughs> Yes. Um, so related to the last question, do you have any kind of intuition, like for the situation where you're like, you don't have anything to do, but do you have any kind of intuition as to whether or not we could say, well, I don't want the organism to exist, but I'm pretty confident that I could just swap out the gene names or swap out the phenotype for another organism, and you saying that we would say the relationship is still true. As an observer that I'm asking, do you have any intuition as to what extent that your rationale yeah. could be Yeah. Yeah, at the end of the day I have to once again confess ignorance, but that's the reason we're doing these kinds of histograms. Is we're trying to find out a what is there? And you know, in the fields that you operate in, you know, I think it's very interesting. Two noted networks, three noted graphs, you know, like what comes out of them? What are the kinds of bifurcations, the kinds of things that Sija has been up to? So, for example, Harinder Singh in the context of, um, of hematopoiesis has very interesting things that shows mutual repression switches, meaning R1 represses R2, R2 represses R1, are super common for tons of genes in that particular network. There are oscillators. There are various ways to make oscillator. A activates itself, it activates repressor, repressor represses activator. Like that's a very good example of a motif for um, oscillations. So if I had to guess, I would say I expect to find by virtue of evolution that there are lots of over, over and over and over again used architectures. That's my guess. And that, you know, that's why I'm so curious to see what comes of this. Yeah, thanks. Perfect. Uh, any other question? 
No? Okay, so we're going to leave it here. Thanks so much Thanks. for the talk. If you, if you can actually, maybe actually, those that are sitting actually here, maybe you can actually.